Father in heaven, I want to thank you for the word of God. The infallible word of God. There is no other book like our Bible. It is your inspired word given to us to be the standard by which we live, to be the encourager by which we're motivated to live, to be our guide so we could find our way. But this great word was inspired by your Holy Spirit which means in order to receive the word, we need your spirit in this place. We need your spirit to move amongst the aisles and chairs in this room. We need you, Father, to allow everyone here to have an encounter with you like this rich young ruler had. For this is our humble prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. I want you to turn with me to Mark chapter 10. Mark chapter 10, verse 17. Um, we find this story in, in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. John doesn't talk about it, but, but we find this story in, in, in various little bit of different forms in each of those gospels. But I have to say, by far, I love Mark's description. Because Mark, who tends to be very quick in his storytelling, you know, he doesn't waste time with a lot of details, you know. Uh, uh, as my cousin once said, in Mark, you see Jesus always on the move. He's always doing something. Aren't you grateful for that? Jesus is never idle. He doesn't have a lazy moment. He doesn't have a let me sit on the couch and watch TV moment. He doesn't have a moment where he's not doing. Jesus was always doing when he lived on this earth. Imagine he would even pray all night. A man of purpose. The Bible says Jesus was there with the crowd, had just blessed the little children. Gotta love it, right? Everyone watching Jesus take care of what was considered insignificant. Ah, those kids haven't grown up yet. What do they know? They're not at that point where they understand and, 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 and you know, don't bother the teacher with this, right? But that's one thing I love about Jesus, when he went about doing, he did for everybody. To a fault to those who looked at him. Because he even did for the worst of sinners. And they accused him of being a drunken. And a man who hung out with sinners. You've heard me mention that before. But you're going to hear me say it again and again and again, because he is meant to be our example. The question is, how many sinners do you have as your friend? Jesus had a whole bunch of them. And you would say, well, I'm a sinner. Yeah, you have to understand in context of what the Jews called sinners. You understand? We all are sinners. It's true. But Jesus hung out with those who... That was their life. They lived for themselves. Everything they did was for self and self-satisfaction, self-aggrandizement, self-promotion. It was all about self, but many of them in their pursuit of happiness fell short and knew they were falling short knew they were missing something. And Jesus, who was always doing, was ready to do for them what nobody else was willing to do. How many sinners do we embrace as friends every day for the purpose of leading them, not just to the Savior, 
but for showing them that we love them the way the Savior loves them. These little babies came to Jesus, and he blessed them to the shock of everyone there. And as Jesus is probably moving on, you know, Mark, moving on, he's getting ready to go. All of a sudden, you get to this verse, and the Bible says, now, now, as he was going out on the road, Jesus is leaving, verse 17, uh, one came running, knelt before him, and asked him. Now, I, I want to stop because I love that. I mean, he's moving on. He did, his, he did what he had to do for these people. He's moving on. But, but there was someone there who had seen what Jesus was all about, how powerful he was, how willing he was to bless that he was not willing to let Jesus leave that place until he was blessed as well. And he ran to the feet of Jesus. He ran to him. Now imagine the Bible describes him in, 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 in various of the different God, in, in Matthew and in Luke, you know, he, he, he's a ruler. He, he, he was a spiritual young leader, but he was one with prestige and honor, and, and, and everybody would have probably looked up to him as one highly favored by God in the presence of them all, especially as he walked around with his nice clothes, you know, cool ring on his finger, you know, probably drove a Benz when he was coming to church every week had a, an amazing house, you know, big, tons of rooms, tons of room for, for whatever he wanted to do. Man, this guy, he's got it all, but this guy sees in Jesus something so special that he is willing to act like a fool and run to this poor teacher's side. After all, who was Jesus? He was just a poor guy who'd never been trained in any of the schools. What did, what did he know the Pharisees tried to prove, right? If only they saw what the rich young ruler saw that day. And many of them did. But he comes running to Jesus and says to him, Good teacher, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life. What must I do? I love Matthew's version because he comes and says, teacher, what good thing must I do to inherit eternal life? Not just what thing I must do, but what Good thing. And you go, well, why would Matthew include that little detail there? Because Matthew was written primarily to the Jews, the very people who had lived their lives believing that your way to eternal life, your way to have purpose is to do good things. Work your way there because if you do enough good that counters all the bad stuff you've done, God will favor you. Good teacher, what good thing must I do to have eternal life? I imagine that when he saw Jesus, he saw life in Jesus that he didn't have. He saw purpose in Jesus that he didn't have. He saw meaning in Jesus that he didn't have. With all that he had, in the presence of Jesus, he realized, like Solomon, in the book of Ecclesiastes, right? Vanity of vanities. All is vanity. Read that chapter. Just chapter one, if you wish, of Ecclesiastes. You know what Solomon says? I, the preacher, he says, I've gone around. I've tried Everything under the sun. And I'm here to tell you, at the end of the day, it's all pointless. It's all meaningless. It's all striving to grasp the wind, which is an impossibility. 
which is an impossibility. What good thing must I do to have eternal life? Jesus responds. <laughs> I love it. Why do you call me good? No one is good but one. That is God. You, you know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear faults. Witness, do not defraud, honor your father and your mother, right? I mean, he, he gives them the commandments. And he answered and said to him, teacher, all these things I have kept from my, from my youth. And I want you to stop for a moment. He comes to Jesus and says, good teacher, what good thing do I have to do to be saved? Jesus says, who are you calling good? Now you got to understand, for the rich young ruler to call Jesus good was to acknowledge something precious about Jesus. But see, in those days, to go to someone and say, good teacher, was to show them high respect. It was to flatter them. It was in front of the crowd to show that you you had a great respect for that person. Kind of like when we say Mr. So-and-so or Mrs. So-and-so, even though that's kind of leaving our society as well, along with everything else respectful about society. Yeah, you heard that, right? Parents, teach your children how to show respect and stop expecting adults to respect children that have no self-respect themselves. That's really rough on teachers, by the way, and this kind of a side note. Teachers have to deal with parents all the time who have this blind eye towards the fact that their children are whack. And their children are whack because they're whack. Because they've allowed their children to have no meaning and no purpose outside of whatever I want. I'm here to tell you, don't jump on the teacher before you first look yourself in the mirror and ask yourself if your child is actually living a life that's exemplary of what you've taught them. That is if you're teaching them. It's important. You know, I always laugh because, you know, when I was in church growing up, I, I, I grew up in, in, in a... <sighs> In a time where, you know, my parents were pretty strong on how to be behaved in church and, and how to, you know, uh, show reverence and respect around adults and, and many other aspects. And I remember adults used to always tell me not to say Mr. or Miss. Don't call me Mr. That makes me feel old, right? And I remember my dad was like, I don't care what they feel. You better call them Mr. or you're dealing with me, you know? It's important because as we're talking about that aspect, yes, I mean, we're raising, we're raising up our children. We need to raise them up to recognize really good things and, and what is their purpose and meaning in life. But, but it's interesting when this rich young ruler comes to Jesus and says, what good thing must I have eternal life? I mean, he realizes that as a young man, uh, really all the do's and don'ts that he's lived in really hasn't given his life purpose. And even though he has everything to offer, he really has nothing. And so he needs something else. And when Jesus responds to him, he tells him, no one is good. But one, which was the first thing that rich young ruler needed to understand. You're asking for something that's impossible. If you don't believe me, Look at the book of Romans. Look at the book of Romans. Especially from a human. We're talking from a human standpoint. Romans chapter 3. I want you to see what Paul has to say. You've read this before. Romans chapter 3, especially if you joined us in the study of Romans in the Sabbath school lesson, you spent a lot of time in this book. 
I know I did. Romans chapter 3, verse 10. Paul, well, we'll start in verse 9. Paul speaking to the Jews about the Greeks says, What then? Are we better than they? Not at all. For we have previously charged both Jews and Greeks that they are all under what? I mean, are, are they better than us? I mean, and that's the deal that he had to deal with. He had to deal with these high religious affluent people who thought, Hey, we've got the truth. And the rest of the world doesn't want to hear it. We don't talk like that today, right? You know what Paul had to do? He had to wrestle with the people of God to help them to understand. The only reason you have truth is because of the goodness and grace of God. Because at the end of the day, the playing field is even. We are all under sin. And he begins to quote the scriptures and say, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks after God. They have all turned aside. They have together become unprofitable. There is none who does what? Good. Verse 12 of Romans 3, there is none who does good. No, not one. Their throat is an open tomb. With their tongues they have practiced deceit. The poison of ass is under their lips, whose Mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways. And the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. You know what Paul says? It's a bad case for humanity. To find anything good naturally in ourselves. It's a bad case. Because guess what? We're so messed up that the Bible says there's no one who even seeks after God. But if you don't believe that, ask yourself the question, when was the last time you spent time in the Bible? Really? Seeking God. In your life. When was the last time you were on your knees pleading for God to come into your life and perform the things that He alone can do? The truth of the matter is, if it were left to us, we'd all be lost. If it was left to us, we'd all be lost. But that's what's amazing about Jesus. Jesus doesn't wait for you to seek him out. He sought you out first. He sought you out first. And if you don't believe it, listen, he's seeking you again today. Right now. In the hearing, he is seeking me, he is seeking you, he is seeking us out who know no good to show us how good he is. For Jesus told the young man, no one is good but one, one, one is good, no one but one. One, right? And, and he lays that out before him in a way that there was no undenying of what he was trying to say. It, Jesus was basically telling the rich young ruler, do you get it? If you consider me good, do you get what you're ultimately saying? If I'm good, then I'm not just a man. Because the only one who is good is God. By default, Jesus was seeking to reveal to that young man that he was talking to more than just a good teacher. He was talking to the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. He was talking to his creator. Think about that talking to the one who formed you in the womb, the one who laid out every detail, mapped out your life, and brought you to this point, this encounter 
with him. Imagine that. He was talking to his creator. But Jesus, I love what he says next. He tells him, you know the commandments. And he begins to quote several of them, right? And what's he quoting from? Good Adventists, Christians, Ten Commandments, right? He quotes from the Ten Commandments. And, and, and you read that and you go, all right, yeah. I mean, this is the standard. In fact, I imagine the rich young ruler looking at Jesus and he says to him, listen, man, I want to know whatever I need to have to have eternal life to find purpose. You tell me jump, I'll say, how high? And I'll make that jump. I will do whatever it takes to have eternal life. And, and he meant that in many ways from the sincerity of his blind heart. Did you catch me? He was sincere, but oh, he had no clue as to what was really going on. And he was telling Jesus, tell me how high. And you know what? We, we live in that world of standard. I remember when I was younger, um, I had a mentor, loved her to death. Uh, she was a anesthesiologist, and she was a pain doctor, and probably one of the only ones in that area for whew, a radius of several hundred miles or so. I mean, she was an amazing lady. In fact, it was under her that I shadowed surgeons and I shadowed pain doctors. I, you know, I went into operating rooms held the gallbladder in my hand, all that fun stuff, because in, in that point in my life, I was considering also becoming a physician, a doctor. And I always wanted, you know, I felt the call of God to be a pastor, but I always wanted to also be a physician, because in my mindset, I said, well, pastors don't make much money, for one thing, and I like taking care of people, so guess what? If I'm a doctor, I can pastor and be a doctor and, and, and not worry too much about any of those other issues. So I, 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 I began the study, and, and she was just amazing. She was such a mentor, she would even come to my parent-teacher conferences just to see what my grades were, what was going on. And I remember she, she was pushing for me to go to Ivy League school because that's where she had gone. She had gone to Dartmouth in the east, here in the East Coast, Northeast Coast area. And she wanted me to look into those same things. And I remember the counsel she gave me. She was an African-American lady in, in the Dakotas, for that matter. Just a few of us Hispanics and African-Americans. I remember... Oh, here's another fun fact about her. She was, her father was Jewish, her mom was a Methodist. Talk about an Adventist. <laughs> if you know a little bit of Adventist history, of course. But anyway, she became an Adventist uh, shortly after we had arrived there. At, uh, I remember she looked at me and she said, Jose, when you go to university, some of you are going to understand this, some of you. <laughs> but she said, you're going to have to work harder than everybody else because you don't look like everybody else. She says, when the professor tells you to jump, all your response needs to be is, how high? And you jump. And I remember listening to that, and I would say to her, yeah, but I'm planning to go to Adventist University. <laughs> I said, I'm not going to some place where this is going to be like that. I'm like, well, we're, we're, we're past that. She said, listen to me. When they say jump, you say how high, and you jump because you will always have to outperform the person next to you. It's stuck in my head, you know. That's where she come from. She was a successful physician. She had two homes. She had cars. She had a lot. And she had worked hard to get to where she was. But lo and behold, when I decided I wasn't going to go to Ivy League school, I was going to go to Adventist school and study theology. She didn't quite understand that. In her mind, I could go to a school and have all the great credentials. I could study theology at Harvard if I wanted to. And she would have helped me do it. She said, who wouldn't hire you 
if you graduated from Harvard. I'm like, Adventist. <laughs> Adventist wouldn't. She's like, and, and, and this was the world she had come from. This was push, push, push. When I finally made my decision to go to school and to study theology, and that became my focus, we lost contact because that was not her interest anymore. But I was staying true to something higher than just what I wanted to be. And so this young man lived under that philosophy. You tell me jump, I say, how high? So when Jesus gave him the list of the Ten Commandments, do you know what his response is? You saw it, right? I've done that. I have done that. Since I was young, I've been working that way. I can jump as high as you need me to jump. That's it. I, I, I've got this down. <laughs> if only we recognize what Jesus was trying to tell him. So Jesus looks at him again. And I love Mark because only Mark says these words. Mark chapter 10, verse 21, the Bible says, Then Jesus, looking at him, loved him. Don't you love it? I want you to realize something today. When Jesus looks at you, he loves you. He looks at you with eyes of love. You may not look at yourself with eyes of love, but how can he not look at himself? at his creation, at his sons and daughters with eyes of love. I mean, after all, have you ever seen a parent with a kid? It don't matter what they look like. They're beautiful. Right? Handsome, good-looking. May not be. But hey. Hey. You know, I'm reminded of one comedian who, when he had his baby, looked down at it and said, what is it? <laughs> what is it? <laughs> but you can never go to a parent and say to them, that child is ugly, and expect not to get clocked. <laughs> right? You can't expect that, because that's your child. Do you imagine that for all of humanity that was created in the image of God, you don't think that God doesn't look at you with love in his eyes saying, you're beautiful. You're beautiful. Not because of what you are, but because of what I'm creating in you to be. Rather, recreating in you to be. I see the end product. Like my wife always says about me, she saw the end product. She had to chip everything else off, as she puts it. He sees the end product. And so this young man, he looks at him with love and says to him, one thing you lack, go your way, sell whatever you have and give it to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come, take up the cross and do what? Follow me, which is interesting because only Mark adds that extra line in there. Take up your cross and do what? Follow me. Let me tell you something. If that young man would have understood what Jesus was saying that day, rather than turning and walking away, which is what he did, he would have fallen on his knees saying, Father, the standard is way too high. I can't even come close to making that jump. He should have fallen on his knees and said, Lord, help my unbelief. He should have understood that the only way to have anything good inside of him was to have the Savior, the Creator, the good God, 
captivating every part of his mind, his body, and his soul. That is what he needed. He needed a full surrender. A hundred percent. But all he heard when he heard Jesus say, sell all you have, all he heard was one more thing he had to do that he wasn't willing to. I want to share something with you from Christ Object, uh, from Desire of Ages. Two quotes, page 519. I want you to see something that's said. Christ was drawn to this young man. He knew him to be sincere in his, asser- in his assertion. All these things I have kept from my Youth, the Redeemer longed to create in him that discernment which would enable him to see the necessity of heart devotion and Christian goodness. He longed to see in him a humble and contrite heart, conscientious of the supreme love to be given to God and hiding, watch this, and hiding its lack in the perfection of Christ. You see, that's sometimes where we get it wrong. We understand how much we need to love God or, or, or what that love looks like. But we fail to hide its lack in our lives under the perfection of Christ. And she says one more thing that I found amazing. Christ dealing with the young man is presented as an object lesson. God has given us the rule of conduct which every one of his servants must follow. It is obedience to his law, not merely a legal obedience, but an obedience which enters into the life and is exemplified in the character God has set, his own standard of character for all who would become subjects of his kingdom. Only those who will become co-workers with Christ, only those who will say, Lord, all I have and all I am is... Thine will be acknowledged and sons and daughters of God. All should consider what it means to desire heaven and yet to turn away because of the conditions laid down. Think of what it means to say no to Christ. The ruler said no. I cannot give you all. Do we say the same? The Savior offers to share with us the work God has given us to do. Isn't that purpose? Listen. The Savior offers to share with us the work God has given us to do. He offers to use the means God has given us to carry forward his work in the world. Only in this way can he save us. Only in cooperating with God's work can he save us. His work in us and his work through us. But it was too much. As we're coming to the close, I want you to realize Jesus knew that reality. And he made something clear in Luke 14, 26. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. This is Luke 14, 27. And whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you intending to build a tower does not sit down first and count the cost, whether he has enough to finish it? Lest after he has laid the foundation is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, this man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king going to make war against another king does not sit down first and consider whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes after him with 20,000? Or else, while the other is still a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks conditions of peace. So likewise, whoever of you does not forsake what? Some. Forsake a little bit. Forsake half of you. Forsake 80%. Forsake 90%. What about 99.9? 
whoever of you does not forsake all that he has cannot be my disciple. I'm going to tell you, Jesus called that rich young ruler to recognize it's only in surrendering to me that then you can learn what it is to cooperate with me. And if you're cooperating with me, then you will do the works that I have for you to do on behalf of me. And it it will be a blessing to all of humanity. But in order for that to happen, you have to be willing to lay it down. You have to be willing to deny yourself. You have to stop making excuses for why you're not fulfilling the purpose God has for you. The only excuse that should come into your heart is the one that draws you to fall on your knees and say it's too much. I need your help to live a life of service, to live a life of sacrifice. See, we still don't know sacrifice because we think sacrifice is to drive 40 minutes to church. We think that's sacrifice. Brothers and sisters, we don't know sacrifice yet. We're about to face it soon. By our choosing or by the way this world is going. And I'm going to tell you, if you're hearing tonight saying, or this (laughs) afternoon, I got up later to preach, so hang with me. If you're sitting there like the rich young ruler saying, Lord, I want purpose, I want meaning. But the idea of giving everything to you, the idea of sacrifice, it's too much. I want to call you to remember this last verse that you're going to read. This last verse is a promise God gave his people a long time ago in Ezekiel 36, 25. It says, then I, speaking God, then I will sprinkle clean water on you and you shall be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. I will give you a new heart, and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you will keep my judgments and do them. Don't you love that? God told Zechariah in a vision the same thing to tell the the leader of Israel, not by might nor by power, but by my Spirit, says the Lord, you know what he promises? I'll put my spirit in you. But notice how the promise really comes to a close. As he says in verse 36, then the nations which are left all around you shall know that I, the Lord, have rebuilt the ruined places and planted what was desolate. I, the Lord, have spoken and I will do it. What God does, he doesn't just do for your selfish desires. He does it to bless the entire world. He does it for the entire world. His promise is to bless the entire world. Every single person that lives around you, that you work with, God is trying to bring the plan, the hope of salvation, to someone who, like the rich young ruler says, I want more than what this life can offer. And the question is, have you counted the cost yourself for what it truly costs To follow Jesus. Have you counted what that takes? Church, I've been announcing to you that we are joining Voice of Prophecy this year. And the churches in the Raleigh area. And our goal is to make a dent in our counties for Christ. 
Our goal is to get out there and share the gospel with someone, to study with someone. And some people go, well, (laughs) he just said Bible studies. I don't like that stuff. But I want you to understand something. Count the cost, brothers and sisters, because giving a Bible study is not a gift of the Spirit. It's a command of Christ. It's a command from your Savior who looks at you with love. He is asking of that in you, but he's actually better than that. He's asking you to let it do it, let him do it in you and through you. And God has opened up a great opportunity because for people to sit there and say, well, I'm nervous, Pastor. I've never, I've never given a Bible study. I've never done that in my life. I don't know how to even to, to step over that route. Well, you know what's beautiful about joining Voice of Prophecy? We're going to get the chance to learn how. Because that's part of the training grounds of this church, is to learn how. And when we're giving that opportunity, all excuses are off the table. Unless, like the rich young ruler, you'd rather say no. We have people dying to hear the gospel around us. And they're not going to hear it just within these four walls once a week. That will never finish the work. And God is calling us to finish the work of the gospel. They're going to be sending out cards, enrollment cards. By the way, what I love about this, I've shared with you, we don't have to pay a single dime for what they're going to do. Because of many of us, and many of you who have faithfully given to evangelism in this conference, you have the opportunity to participate in something big that not every church gets to do. That's the goal of Voice of Prophecy, is to empower churches. And here we are, these enrollment cards are going to go out, and we've agreed as a board zip codes that we want to tackle, and we're waiting for those enrollment cards to come back. They haven't been sent out yet, but we will be waiting for them to come back. While we're waiting, the plan is to begin training, learning how to do it. Because I'm going to tell you something. If each of you here today would be willing to step out of your comfort zone, not because you are capable, but because the Christ before you is capable. And give one study this year with the training and guidance you're giving. Sacrifice one hour of your week with somebody else. You would be partnering. You'd be going two by two. One person and, and, and give them that study. Do you understand that this building would already have to be remodeled and rebuilt? It'd be done. You say, yeah, but there's other things we need to do. We need to love people. Let me tell you something. When you start giving a Bible study once a week with somebody, you begin to grow in a relationship with them. And when you grow in a relationship with them, you begin to love them. And when you begin to love them, when they have needs, you want to help fulfill those needs. Half of the issues that we always try to do to keep people in the church, to keep people in Christ, half of that would be already dealt with if we would invest time to make a friend with somebody as we share with them the gospel that they've asked us to share with them. We have that privilege One hour a week, and if you think that is too much, even if you say, well, I got to travel, that's three hours a week. I'm going to tell you something. We're going to be having an evangelistic meeting in the spring of next year with Sean Boonstra. And you know what I love whenever we do evangelistic meetings? We'll take a month out of our schedule, those of us who volunteer, and we'll volunteer almost 75 hours in that month. 75 hours. That's counting three hours a week, five nights a week for an entire month. You understand? Three hours. We will give 75 hours in one month, and sometimes we win, we, we make a relationship, we make a connection with maybe two people. And I'm going, if we can sacrifice 75 hours in one month, 
Can we not sacrifice 24 over the course of a few months? 24, not even close. That's two hours I'm giving you travel time. Two hours a week. Now you say, well, pastor, the sermon's over. (laughs) It almost is. But here's what I need you to understand. I'm not with you every Sabbath. This is my opportunity to talk to all of you. You know why? Because if I called a meeting on Sunday for us to come together and talk about this, guess what? I wouldn't have your ear. And I love you too much to not have your ear. We have the ability to reach the lost. We have the ability to do it together as a family. We have the ability to show people the love of Christ in a way that no one in this county has ever experienced it before. The question is, have you counted the the cost? Is it worth it to you? Are you willing to Throw those nerves down before the feet of Jesus and say, Lord, I'm willing for you to teach me and I'm willing to partner with someone and I'm willing to go out there and do what the disciples of Christ did. Why should we let, as I've said to you before, other denominations do better than us in getting to people door to door? You have them at your home sometimes. Why should we allow that to happen when we've been gifted with such precious truth? I can't do it on my own. Your church board cannot do it on your own. We need each other and we need Christ. So here's what I'm going to do. We're going to close out today. We're going to sing a song that we all know well. I surrender all. As we sing that song together, if you've heard the voice of Jesus today as you've pondered the story of the rich young ruler, if you've heard his voice telling you to take up that cross and follow him, If you're willing to take advantage of the opportunity to learn to invest time in someone else's life. That's what a Bible study is. It's not just about giving them information. It's investing time in somebody else's life. Showing them how much they're loved. And if that is your desire, (laughs) I'm going to ask you to stay by with me right before we go to potluck. Because I want to share with you what we're doing next. Unlike other groups, I'm not going to force you to do it. But I'm going to invite you as a Seventh-day Adventist Christian who believes Jesus is coming soon to count the cost, to allow Jesus to pay the price as he already has, and to let him use you. I'm going to stay up here. I'm not going anywhere. Brother Dan's going to greet you in the back. I'm going to stay right here with the brave and courageous. Now, I understand. Some may end up saying, well, I'm not ready yet, and you're going to leave. Listen, you're not going to get judgment from me, okay? You're not going to get me looking at you saying, oh, you must be a weak Christian. I don't believe that. There are some of us still trying to run to Jesus. Amen? 
There's still some of us who aren't there yet, and, and that's okay too. I understand that. But I hope that you leave today asking that question about what meaning your life really has. What purpose does your life have? And does it go beyond this one into eternity? That's what I hope you leave with today, regardless of what you choose to do with us as a church. Let's sing together. Stand, please, if you would. All to Jesus. All to Jesus I surrender. All to Him I freely give. I will ever love and trust Him in His presence daily live. I surrender I surrender all, all to Jesus I surrender, humbly at His 